Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Jeannie Davison and I'm the Industry Development Manager at Screenworks. Thank you very much for joining us today for the fourth of our Gender Matters webinars, which we're very pleased and excited to be hosting in collaboration with Screen Australia and the Gender Matters Task Force. As a national organisation, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, including those joining us for our webinar today and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. And in particular, I'd like to pay my respects to the Nyangbu people of the Bundjalung Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land here in Ballina, where I'm speaking to you from today. So now it's my very great pleasure to hand you over to our facilitator today, Lisa French. Hi, everyone. Uh... I'm pleased to be chairing this session and to welcome our audience from all parts of Australia today. In a moment, I'll introduce you to the first speakers of our wonderful panel. But I did want to say that uh, this is, of course, an initiative of the Gender Matters Task Force, which you will know has been working really hard to increase female participation in and equality in the industry and to help women with resources for their careers and also we hope to showcase uh, women in the Australian screen sector. The first speaker today is Yara Bumelam. Yara is a journalist, writer and director. Her 2021 debut feature, Unseen Skies has just had its world premiere in competition at the San Francisco International Film Festival. The film, which was produced by Oscar-winning company participant and in films, follows American artist Trevor Paglin and his mind-bending works that lift the lid on the inner workings of digital and mass surveillance. Yara has also made a number of shorts, including War on Truth in 2019, which followed UNESCO World Press Freedom Prize winner and digital rights pioneer, Maria Reza, and her global campaign against disinformation. She's crawled through Syrian rebel held tunnels, filmed in lawless Libyan jails after the fall of Gaddafi and followed cannabis farmers in Lebanon, joining the fight against ISIS. She is currently directing a documentary series for the ABC and is also the inaugural journalist in residence at the Judith Nielsen Institute for Journalism and Ideas, where she will create work that is at the intersection of journalism, art and film. Thanks, Yara. Please tell us about the route you took to documentary. Lisa, thanks for that introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be part of this conversation with some really impressive filmmakers. Um, I'm speaking to you all from Darawal country, about an hour south of Sydney on land that was never ceded. I was born and raised um, in Sydney um, to parents who came here from Lebanon during its bloody civil war, uh, not long after the abolition of the white Australia policy. Um, but I spent the better part of the last decade abroad um, and I've always really been interested in global affairs um, and I have always looked outwards and I think that really informs my practice as a filmmaker and as a journalist and I've made films that largely have um, international themes or um, feature people with very similar um, global outlooks. Um, as you mentioned Lisa I'm a journalist and a filmmaker and I, I do see myself as both um, and I have had formal training in journalism, and I think that um, really comes across in my films. And, you know, our practices are constantly evolving as filmmakers, but, you know, for the moment, um, I see myself as someone who largely makes um, films that are journalistic in nature. And what I mean by that is that I make films that I hope um, will form part of the historical record. And I think when you frame it that way, then, um, automatically you'll start thinking about um, imbuing your films with journalistic principles about getting the details right, getting the facts right, um, and trying to layer it with some of the complexity and nuances that are invariably attached to the issues that you'll be focusing on uh, in your films. But you also want people to engage 
with what the ideas that you're presenting. I think that's why film is such a great medium for that because you can really play with form um, and you know find ways to make it more engaging um, and entertaining to engage with audiences. Um, you know, as for the career pathways that I took to getting into the industry, um, I, I did have um, formal training in journalism. So I studied journalism and law at university. And, um, but at the same time, I didn't really know anyone in the industry. So I just found myself a very entry level position at SBS serving tea and coffee to guests at a talk show at SBS. Um, you know, which was really valuable. And I think, you know, for all, I know that a lot of the people on this webinar today are early career filmmakers. And I think you can't really underestimate how important it is just to find your way into a building or into a room with people who are making the things that you want to make and, and figuring out exactly how things work. Um, and you know, while I was there, I noticed that this program had a terrible website um, and I was 20 or 21. So I thought I was really digital savvy just by virtue of being young. Um, so I came up with this whole proposal about how I'd revamp their website and created this position for myself where I'd be the online producer. Um, and I don't know if the EP just thought I was like, I had so much gumption just walking into his office and pitching this position for myself or they actually did need someone to do that or a bit of both, but I got that job. And then um, from there, I got a cadetship at SBS and I became a TV news reporter, um, but I had always wanted to make international films. Um, and so I looked over at Dateline um, you know, which was this fantastic uh, foreign affairs program. Um, and most of the people there were, you know, just one type of person and that wasn't me. Um, but there was also this young woman there who had gone off when she was quite young and made some films and came back and kept pestering Dateline until they gave her work. And so I thought, okay, I'll just go off and make some work too. And I, I thought about what was my point of difference or sort of my unique selling point, And it was my Arabic language skills and my encyclopo encyclopedic knowledge of the Middle East. So I um, started looking for, for films in the Middle East that I could make. And I went to Jordan on a holiday and came across this stored story about um, these women that were being jailed by their government in order to protect them from their families because they're at risk of an honor killing. So the government had no idea how to protect these women. So they just stuck them in jail, um, innocent women. And there was this uh, legal firm that was trying to get them out. And so, and I convinced this outfit to let me follow that process. And I was able to film with these women, some of whom had been in jail for upwards of 20 years for no crime. Um, and it's still one of my favorite stories um, that I've ever filmed. And it ran on Dateline and it won a Walkley and I very much became, you know, on, I very much went on the Dateline track, um, but I wanted to also build up my Arabic skills. And so I went to Damascus and studied Arabic for a little while and then couldn't help myself and found a story about political prisoners and made that for Dateline just about the same time as the Arab Spring kicked off and just followed that momentum and was just making film after film for, for Dateline during the Arab Spring. And then I became, then I came up on the radar of Al Jazeera English and started making films for them and started making more films um, outside of the Middle Eastern region. And what was great about Dateline is that I got the journalism on point with them, but Al Jazeera English really is where I developed the craft skills of filmmaking. Um, you know, they had really high production values and they just had more resources to throw at things as well. And then a few years ago, I came back to Australia and I wanted to make more films. Um, and there seemed to be a little bit of resistance here in Australia to people with a background in journalism making films. And I didn't quite understand it because there is this movement in Europe and, and the US to more journalistic style filmmaking. 
Um, so I did what I normally do when I come up against an obstacle and I just go out, go off and start making. Um, and so I started making a feature documentary, the one that you just mentioned and got some really early interest from um, the US um, with participant and then in films in Australia and I was able to make that film. So I think there is a recurring theme here that I kind of had to make my own opportunities in this industry. And I think that's true for anyone working in the industry because it's highly competitive and there aren't a lot of resources around to support filmmaking. But I also think that a lot of my major filmmaking opportunities have come from abroad. And a lot of the great collaborations um, I've had have been with folks um, overseas. And I suppose, um, you know, when I got back here, the, I didn't see still a lot of people, um, you know, people from non-European backgrounds or females making films in Australia. And I think a lot of that has to do with the reality of our history. It's a relatively recent phenomena for women to be part of the workforce. And we're all still working through that and getting that equal representation. And then I think if you're a woman of color, it's a double whammy because up until the 60s or the 70s, um, you're either invisible or just non-existent by virtue of you know, various government policies. And I think the film and television industry is still playing catch up, but you know, there are some positive signs that you know, things are changing. Thank you so much. That's so interesting. It um, just shows any career is what you make it. And, you know, making your own opportunity, I think, is a really documentary type thing uh, to do. But I think one of the things you said was that it's thinking about your own unique selling point. And I think that's a really productive um, activity. So thank you so much, Yara. Uh, our next guest is uh, Santilla Chingaipe who is a, also a journalist and filmmaker. So there's a bit of a theme going on here. Uh, she spent nearly a decade working for SBS World News, reporting from across Africa and interviewing some of the continent's most prominent leaders. She also curated Africa Talks, a series in partnership with the Wheeler Centre in Melbourne, which explored perceptions about African Australian identity, representation and politics. Her documentary work includes the landmark SBS program, Date My Race, and her latest documentary series, Third Culture Kids, airs on the ABC later this year. Santilla is the founder of the biannual Behind the Screens initiative in partnership with the Footscray Community Arts Centre and supported by Film Victoria and Screen Australia. And it aims to increase the participation of people from underrepresented groups in the Australian screen industry. Her work explores contemporary migration, cultural identities and politics. She was awarded a State Library of Victoria Fellowship for re research into the African migration to Australia pre-Federation and writes regularly for the Saturday paper and is also a member of the federal government's advisory group on Australian African relations. Wank welcome Santilla, tell us about your journey to documentary production. Thanks, Lisa, and thank you for that very uh, generous introduction. It's very strange uh, to hear about your work um, as told by someone else. So um, thank you so much for, for that very generous introduction. And also like following Yara, who, whose work I greatly admire. I actually wanted her career when we worked at SBS. I was in Melbourne, she was in Sydney, and um, I was just a big fan of what she was doing in terms of bringing to, uh, I think, Australian audiences the, these global stories that were happening, which I think are very important for us to be very mindful of, because I think we can get quite insular with um, our outlook, which is not always a good thing. Um, so in terms of my own journey into documentary filmmaking, so yeah, I started at SBS, I started in radio, um, which is still my favorite medium, even though I um, shouldn't probably say that so publicly, but um, I love radio and I started working in radio and I think the intimacy of working in radio and the fact that radio, unlike any other medium, asks so much of you as the person that's telling the story. 
because the audience isn't really committed, doesn't really owe you anything. You know, when they pick up a book or when they decide to watch something, they really are making a, an investment in their time. But with radio, it can be very fleeting. So if you don't grab them in the first couple of seconds, um, you can lose their attention. So I really loved that it really forces you to think about what you want to say and how you want to say it. And I guess I did that for a number of years and um, I had sort of tried to sort of do the whole video journalism thing. And unlike Yara, I wasn't very skilled at, um, you know, filming and also thinking about all sorts of things that were going on. But I always loved um, the long form side of storytelling and I loved telling audio documentaries and I was very fortunate to have met um, a, a woman filmmaker actually by the name of Judy Reimer. She's a documentarian and I met her at a film festival. I was moderating a, a panel and um, she pulled me aside and she sort of said to me after the panel, she's like, you should be making films. And I was I think 26 or 27 and it had never crossed my mind. I just sort of thought, you know, like I'd always wanted to be a journalist. I was like, I've never seen anyone that looks like me making films. So how in the hell do I do it? Um, but Judy was very persistent. And um, the next day she called me up and she said, I've found a DP for you. And I want you to go out and just get as many interviews as you can and see if you like it. If you don't, then that's fine. And I did, and I fell in love. And I just sort of thought, gosh, this is what I really want to, really want to do with my life. Um, and along that journey of uh, making and learning to make documentaries, I um, decided that I didn't, I found the news format to be quite limiting. At that time, um, SBS had sort of changed in the way the news structure was. So I started off in radio and by the time that I was sort of leaving, would sort of um, merge into this one newsroom. So you were sort of filing for radio television online. And I found the, the two minute format on television to be very lim limiting to tell very complicated and complex issues and documentary seemed like the right space. Um, but then also Screen Australia was sort of going through a reckoning around diversity and inclusion. And they commissioned um, a report uh, called Seeing Ourselves, if I call that correctly. And it was about diversity on screen. And um, as part of that initiative, they invited uh, people from storytelling backgrounds to come for a workshop, to go for a workshop in Sydney, which was essentially supposed to be about uh, narrative filmmaking. And again, I'd never thought about narrative filmmaking and it just, and going to that, that not only opened up opportunities for me in terms of um, narrative filmmaking, but it just expanded my practice. And so now I sit at this weird intersection where I make documentaries for broadcast, I make narrative and drama films, I write, books. I'm writing a history book at the moment and I also make art films. Um, and the reason why I sort of bounce across different mediums is that I find that we books, I'm writing a history book at the moment about um, uh, convict history. So it's about black convicts that were transported to the Australian penal colonies um, from the time of the beginning of transportation from 1788 up until 1840. And um, that research is now becoming a history book, but I, know, I, I also know that not everyone's gonna pick up a history book because it's not everyone's cup of tea. And so the idea of then making these stories accessible to a wider audience is where the documentary side of it comes in. And that means that I can make something that is accessible and free. Um, and so there's a documentary based on the book that's coming out in SBS in September. Um, and that one way of making sure that these stories are shared, but then with art, it just means that I can be very, pointed with what I want to say and I don't have to really hold myself back. So that's kind of how I straddle the different worlds. But I wanted to share a really um, short film, my first short film that I made, um, because I, again, I'm aware that there are people that are emerging filmmakers and I hope that what I'm saying is helpful in some way, but by sharing this video, there's just a couple of things that I was going to talk about. Um, I don't know if Amy is queuing it up for us. The first time I realised I wasn't just black, but very black, blue black, very black, midnight black. I was on a school excursion to Canberra and someone confused me for a black marble sculpture of a dead coloniser. I've learned to sit very still in public 
and limit my movements to make people comfortable and unafraid. People aren't expecting a thing as black as me to be real, to be human. This was something I had to get used to. When I was a young girl, I didn't have an understanding of what racism was. I didn't see myself. I didn't exist. It wasn't that I hated how I looked, but there was this sense that I must be unattractive, even if I didn't feel it in my body. I must be unappealing. I must be ugly. I've learned people are incapable of seeing anything other than blackness and what my skin colour means to them. But I can't change how I'm seen. There's only so much bleach in the world and no surgeon could ever make me look like the little blonde girls I went to school with. This is my reality. I have learned to be proud of and to accept who I am. I am a Tonga Tem. I am an artist and I am a black woman. Um, so that film, um, what, like I said, was the first film that I, that, I, that I made and it sort of sits at the intersection of narrative and, and doc. The reason why I wanted to share that was um, if there is anything that is useful for anyone that is emerging was that that was an initiative that um, I, see, I think Screen Australia at the time targeted um, female filmmakers and it was a really, really short amount of, small amount of money that they were, they were giving to that initiative. But why I recommend that those sorts of initiatives is that they give you things like credits, which I've found to be quite helpful, particularly when applying for funding. And if you were just emerging, it's quite difficult to get people to take your work seriously if you don't have those uh, credits, which you can only get if you have your work screened at film festivals or if they're uh, aired by a broadcaster or if um, you have the backing of a very big production company. So it can be very, very difficult. Um, so I would really recommend that if any initiatives show up that you put your name forward because that really does add some value. Um, but also the other thing that I think um, was in, useful for me in, in talking about that and sharing that is that a lot of my works looks, um, the moving image for me is something that I find quite interesting because historically, you know, people like me have not been included as part of the, 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 the gaze, the Western canon of film. And I'm also very aware that, um, you know, the camera in many ways was used as a weapon for imperialism. And so I try to deliberately question who is doing the looking and why are they looking? And so a lot of how I document and record things is very much collaborative with the communities that I tell the stories about, but also being very mindful that, um, you know, I don't also want to repeat the violence by how I'm choosing to, to look at these people. Thank you so much for showing your wonderful work. I think uh, a lot of questions will come about kind of where to start and whether to go for that, that smaller piece that shows what you can do. And I think uh, everyone on the panel actually has a really strong uh, identity um, story to tell in inside all of their work. Um, thank you so much. And now I'm going to move uh, to introduce you to Gillian Moody. Jill's a woody woody woman from New South Wales. She's worked uh, in production roles at SBS and as an independent I'm sorry, independent and development manager in Screen Australia's Indigenous department before stepping into the freelance world seven years ago and starting her own company, Calorie Productions. She was series producer in 2016 of Family Rules, a six half hour documentary series for NITV. And in 2017, she produced Black Divas as a collaboration with director Adrian Russell Willis. That film followed the inaugural Miss First Nations drag pa uh, pageant and it premiered at the Sydney Queer Screen Mardi Gras where it received the Audience Award for Best Documentary before screening on NITV and 
also on SBS. She then stepped into the director's shoes on a project for the New South Wales Teachers Federation with the film Namu Gurung, which is, I think, means to see a path for children. That documentary tells the in inspiring story of Aboriginal teachers and the work of the union in Indigenous education. G Gillian continues to collaborate with Adrian and they're currently co-directing their feature documentary, Kindred, a personal story of friendship, family and adoption. And Jill works across both documentary and drama productions. And I'm sure the questions will come in about that. Welcome, Jill. Your experience um, is, is quite broad. Tell us about your path into the industry. Yeah, um, my path into the industry started several years ago now, <laughs> going back over 20 years. I, um, I actually heard about a course that was being run at the um, AFTRS that used to be out at North Ride. Um, and it was being run by one of our, pi our pioneers of Indigenous screen, Uncle Lester Bostock. Um, and the idea of the, that the course was to get more Indigenous people involved in media across radio, film and television. And it was a six month intensive training course. So, um, so I applied for it and, um, and got in. Um, I want to just quickly say that I'm coming to you today from Wongal and Gadigal, and Gadigal um, nations from the from, De, from the Darug and the Eora nations here in Sydney, but I'm actually a Wadi Wadi woman, as you mentioned, and a Monaro woman from the New South Wales South Coast. But I grew up with my adopted family up on Garingai country on the northern beaches here in Sydney. So, um, so I sort of feel like I'm a, a connected to several places when I think about home. Um, but I came across that course and for me that was an interesting fact was that it was the first time I'd actually been in a classroom that was all Indigenous people in my life. Um, so it was quite daunting and, um, and it wasn't necessarily an area that I had aspirations or dreams to end up working in. I just knew that I wanted to do something creative. Um, I actually left school and thought I'd be a teacher. That didn't work out for the first year. And so then this course came up and I suddenly found a place that I felt like I, that was a good match. Um, Uncle Esther was a champion for me in terms of my career. He sort of went on to support me and invited me back the second year to be an assistant teacher on the, the next year's course, which was an amazing opportunity. Um, and then he invited me to to take up a traineeship at Metro Screen um, back in the day when Metro Screen was around. And so that was sort of where I began working in this industry. Um, and I kind of started from the ground up. I worked in sort of production assistant roles and researcher roles and things like that. Um, out of that traineeship came an opportunity for me then to move across and work with um, at SBS in the Indigenous Media Unit there on a program called ICAM. I don't know if people remember that one. Um, it was a magazine style, sort of cultural magazine style program, which um, basically sort of had mini docos or mini stories in each um, week's episodes. And so I, yeah, I, as I said, I sort of started from the, the ground up in terms of roles. So I was a production assistant and a researcher. And then um, I was had the opportunity to do a couple of stories myself. Um, and yeah, so that's been, I spent 10 years working at SBS across ICAM and Living Black and a few other programs there. And I've worked my way up to eventually being a production manager. Um, and so, from there, I got an opportunity to go and work at AFC and the Indigenous Department um, at the AFC, which then became Screen Australia. And I was, as you said, an investment and development manager there in that department there. Um, and I worked there for eight years. And some of the work that we did there was um, around documentary filmmaking, of course, because that department works across both drama and documentary. One of the initiatives that um, we ran uh, at the Indigenous Department was one called the National Indigenous Documentary Fund. And that was, a, that was an initiative set up to um, engage with emerging and first time filmmakers in making their first documentary. Um, and those initiatives were often teamed with broadcasters. So it would alternate between like SBS or ABC. Um, so there's a real importance, I think, to be seen in, in supporting our our national broadcasters in that way, in that sense, and the opportunities that they 
they gave to us, and not myself, not just myself, but other filmmakers here on this um, panel today. Um, I might just quickly show a little clip, which is um, maybe for, I might actually start with family rules, if that's all right, because that's the first project that I was involved with once I left Screen Australia and stepped out to the freelance world. Really scary world, I have to say. Um, <laughs> I've um, been in it now for six years and coming from sitting behind desks where I was, you know, constantly had a week to week salary and things like that to stepping into the freelance world was very challenging. Um, so I would definitely say that's one of the biggest challenges I've faced um, in this industry is the, the freelance world. I've had many friends and watched them go through that themselves, but to actually be in it and experiencing it myself was quite a different thing. Um, so very quickly, I might just quickly show um, the little clip for Family Rules, if that's all right, because that was a project that was a, a very female driven project. I, I actually moved across to WA for nine months of my life to work on that, that project. Um, it was con conceived from a very dear friend, Carla Hart, and produced by Renee Kennedy. So it was strong female um, voice behind this, this one. And it's about a mother and nine daughters, basically. Great, thanks, Amy. Can we see that? I'm Daniela, and these are my girls. I am the eldest. I'm second. Number three. Number four. Five. The six. Number seven. Eight. And the last one. There's nine of us, and we're crazy. Your butt's in my face! <laughs> Get off social media and come help clean up. Wi-Fi's going bye-bye. She's dragon lady. We fight lots. Whose top is that? Take it off. Ow. Hello. When you start getting a boyfriend, you got to respect yourself. Have you had your first kiss already? Let's <laughs> not talk about this. I think I'm giving her too much freedom. Yeah, reattach that ball and chain. I've been a single parent since 2004, and I pretty much put my life on hold so I can be a good mother. It's hard to let go. There's always entertainment in our family. My sisters are constantly telling me what to do. No, no. It's ugly. Take it off. Oh, you look tired. I'm exhausted. <laughs> I want to give you a better understanding of where you come from. So turn your Facebooks off, please. This is cultural. Alicia's a sister that pushes my buttons the most. She always touches my stuff. Alicia, Alicia, are you in my room? To me, family means love. Oh, I'm gonna start crying. I just want to see my happy. She's always wanted us to get a good education. Getting a world page job is really important to me. My girls are my life. All nine of them, they inspire me. <laughs> just don't want them giving up on their dreams. This is a new generation. Um, yeah, so that was a six part series and uh, it was a really challenging project to step out and to sort of take on a series producing role um, for the first big job of, of production work, um, wrangling a mother and nine daughters uh, and yeah, having to sort of come up with their, their live stories basically um, and tell that in such a way that um, people would, would fall in love with them. The great thing about that series is it's actually gone on to now have two, to have two other series follow it. I didn't go back and work on those other series just because I had other things of my own life, in my own personal life that I wanted to pursue and they were projects that um, like Black Divas and then, um, and then now Kindred, the feature documentary that I'm working on now. But I suppose what I wanted to sort of say is that the types of films that I want to do and make is, is about highlighting Indigenous voices in this country. It's about showing um, the plight of our lives here, both the, the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, so there's so things like, um, but we also want to celebrate. And for me, you know, Family Rules was a definite example of, of that. Um, as a series, there's, you know, you hear about the, some of the trauma that that family has faced, but then you also see this amazing family that's celebrating life. Um, and Black Divas is, um, was about 
as, as you mentioned, the first Miss First Nations drag pageant, it, that was back in 2017. It is now um, just had, they just literally crowned, I think their fourth um, diva now, queen, um, just the other week. But um, that was an exciting experience as well. It was the first time that I co-produced on a project. Um, so I co-produced that with Persky Productions, Michaela Persky. Um, and that was with um, Adrian Wills, who is sort of my co-collaborator in life, I suppose. We're best friends and we're just currently sitting right in the pocket of, of filming our um, feature documentary, Kindred, that looks at our friendship and talks about um, uh, our adoption. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much, um, Jill. That's uh, amazing. You're getting a lot of um, positive press in the chat um, uh, for, for the clip that you yeah. showed. And I loved um, in the Divas, um, your main character, the saying something like, well, you can't just go out and be fabulous. Being a drag queen takes skills. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. That was great. Um, okay. So now uh, our fourth and final panellist is Jennifer Peedham. Jen is a BAFTA-nominated director known for her gripping and intimate portraits of people in extreme circumstances. In 2010, Jen was the inaugural recipient of the David and Joan Williams Documentary Fellowship, which recognises and rewards creative ambition, intellectual rigour and innovation in documentary cinema. Her credits include the internationally renowned feature documentaries Solo, Sherpa, and most re recently, Mountain. Solo won multiple awards internationally, including the AFI Award for Best Documentary, the Australian Directors Guild Award, and the Film Critics Circle Award. Sherpa was critically acclaimed on the international festival circuit and won multiple awards, including the Grierson Award at the BFI London Film Festival and a BAFTA nomination in 2016. Her most recent film, Mountain completed a sellout national concert tour, which is seems quite innovative, um, with the Australian Chamber of Orchestra and became the highest grossing Australian documentary in box office history. And it was released theatrically in 27 countries and went on to win three actor awards in 2018. So she's currently in development on a dramatic feature uh, we, uh, about Tenzing Norgay with writer Luke Davies and um, David Michaud. Jen, you have extensive credits as producer, writer and director. How did you get there? Oh, it's been a long and winding road. <laughs> um, it's been so inspiring to hear the other um, panellists' stories too because I think there's so, always so many clues into the different ways, but certainly there's some, some common themes here that I thought I'd draw on and one of them that really seems to be coming out is you know persistence and just doing it anyway and not sitting around and waiting for someone to give you a leg up necessarily and um and then that key thing about credits just how valuable they are and I think there's something very also particular to our funding system that really seems to value the credits and I, I think I clocked that early on and went just hard after getting credits my um, journey journey began, um, I actually, I was in the corporate world. I didn't kind of really know that it was a thing. I didn't know what I wanted to do when I finished school. And so I just went and did a business degree. And um, after having lived overseas for a number of years and, and done a lot of travel, um, and I was watching this uh, show on the ABC called Race Around the World, which I don't know if you guys, younger people in the, in the audience may or may not remember it, but um, it was a show where people like Joe Saf John Safran became kind of um, gained his notoriety um, and Olivia Rousset, who's uh, an, another journalistic, wonderful journalistic filmmaker. And I watched that um, and I thought, oh my God, that's that's it. That's what I want to do, and it was just. And luckily for me, um, not long after that, um, they well, in fact, before they announced that there was going to be a third and final series, I just immediately started to do film courses after hours and and all that kind of thing. 
And then they announced, and in fact, I, I, I quit my job and um, applied to do a postgrad in documentary at VCA. Um, but then the race thing happened at the same time and I ended up by some kind of weird fluke getting into race. And that was my film school. And that was, I will always be so grateful for that opportunity because um, like I never went to film school, but also the opportunity to, to make all those mistakes and have that kind of high level pressure um, on air, you know, you had you basically your first draft of your paper edit went to air of these documentaries and then was broadcast in front of a live studio audience with filmmaker judges. It was like, you know, it was it was pretty hardcore experience. And so you learned quickly. Um, when I finished race, I kind of thought, oh, you know, I'm a filmmaker now and the and the phone's just gonna start ringing and people are gonna offer me films to make surely that's what happens and and crickets <laughs> so I had to figure out what I was going to do because I'd quit my job and while I was sitting around waiting for the phone to ring I was reading the ads at the back of Inside Film Magazine and it said that they were looking for volunteers so I went up to Sydney and I said I'll, I'll, I'll um, volunteer and I was sleeping on my sister's couch and um, on the first day of volunteering I got offered a job at If Magazine and I ended up being there for over six years um, and ended up, um, started as a marketing manager, went to the general manager and ended up becoming the publisher and managing director of, of IF. And if race was my film school, then Inside Film Magazine was my university. Um, and it was the group of people that were there at the time. Um, and the culture of that place was such that we all just, like we did the job and then in every second that we had spare, we were making our own stuff and helping each other make our own stuff. And I kind of established a rule um, where as long as you got the job done, you could just do whatever. And, um, and the directors of the company supported me instead of paying me more, because we're all paid barely anything, um, that I could take more time off. And so what I was doing in the interim was um, racing off to, um, do like any opportunities to camera operate and keep doing things like that. Um, and my kind of, I think if, if Yara's kind of um, like special skill was Arabic, um, mine was probably mountaineering. I'd kind of managed to get myself a leg up into the mountaineering world just by some, again, strange fluke where I was camera operating on adventure races. Um, and so I had gone in like so many of the panels on this, Dateline was a, um, a link that seems to have a lot to do with us in SBS. Um, and I pitched a, a story to Dateline. And so that was my first kind of broadcast credit. Um, off the back of that, I got some high altitude directing um, gigs with Discovery Channel on Everest Expedition. So I sort of started working in, in that field. And I just basically said yes to anything and what yes meant was I was volunteering to shoot and edit my friends weddings and I was volunteering to shoot um, expedition um, expeditions and guiding companies so that I could get technical skills on mountaineering things and I just sort of volunteered all of that so I could practice my skills and I think it's a really valuable thing to know how to shoot to know how to edit to understand sound so that later in your career, when you're working with, you know, camera operators and sound people and all that, you actually know those skills. And um, I think it teaches you about coverage and, and all of these kind of things. So I, I really recommend people grabbing a camera and then learning how to edit. Um, so eventually off the back of that, I, I then thought, right, how am I going to get my first proper credits? And I, I went in and got a job at Essential producing a film that happened to be a mountaineering film that I just happened to be the best person to do because of that, those skills and experience. Um, and it kind of went from there. I'm, I'm, I'm lucky. I don't know that this happens as much anymore, but there I just got thrown in the deep end and, um, and, and was given the opportunity to produce stuff. So I started to build my credits. It took me a long while to actually say I'm a director. Um, for a long time, I thought, oh, no, you know, because I have that business head, I must be more of a producer. And then people just kept saying, Jen, you just need to direct it yourself. And so I've slowly gained the confidence. And it took me a while, though, to take that step. And I'm really glad that I've made it. I still produce a lot of my 
work through my own production company, um, but, uh, you know, being a director is truly what the thing that I love the most. Um, and even in those early films at Essential where things are done a certain way and you make a TV documentary a certain way, I just kept pushing back saying, well, why do I have to work with this documentary cameraman? Why can't I work with a drama cameraman? I, I, why can't I work with a drama editor? I always kind of had this sense that I wanted to make movies rather than documentaries. And that still has really underpinned a lot of my work. Um, I think we're running out of time, so I'm going to jump through this a little bit, but um, I think I, it would be remiss of me not to just talk about some of the realities. Um, I don't know if any of the other panellists have kids. I think I'm the eldest panellist. Um, that is really hard and um, I don't want to lie about that and I've kind of found my own way of, of juggling that um, and that involves a really supportive partner and it involves neighbours and friends and parents and, and for about 10 years there a live-in au pair which meant you know it was pretty squishy in my house but you know it was worth it and all of those people uh, you know contribute to my career and it's it's um but that's that's a tough one and you need to really think it through um and my kids are super part of that world and my world and and they're really proud of the work i do and often their name pop up in credits and things like that um and what else i think i think probably just to finish off what i would say is that you know, if you have the courage to step into the arena, you have to know that there's going to be some knocks, you know, and it takes a lot of courage. You know, I was thinking about Gillian when you said stepping away from the desk at Screen Australia and, and you stepped into the arena. It, it is scary and it is every single project, every time it goes out into the world, and I've got a, a, another one, a, a film called River, coming out um, very soon, you, you do feel very raw and exposed and judged and, you know, it, it's, it's hard, but I think you just have to put the work out there and you have to throw yourself into it and you have to be prepared for some knocks. Um, and that's, um, that's part of being an artist, I think. Um, and, um, and, and what does um, Brene Brown say? It's, it's not the critic who counts. Um, you know, it's, it's who's standing there with you in the arena. Um, and so it's, it's yeah, it's important to have courage um, and, um, and put yourself out there, is what I would say. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Jen. That's really interesting. And I think one of the things that you're flagging there is um, sustainability and how, how you sustain a career, given the industry being flickle, fickle and you're not sure whether you know, money, so you need good partners, you need bosses who let you come in and out of your job, all those kinds of things like like really help and, and actually kind of a strategy in, in place, I guess. So um, I'm sure people would like to hear more about that. I noticed there's some questions coming through, so I'll invite uh, all of the panellists to come back on the screen now and, um, and we'll take uh, some, some questions from the floor and... Um, uh, yeah, so um, just to start while we're uh, getting that all together, um, and this could be a question for any of you, um, what do you wish you knew when you were starting out? Like, um, Jen, can I start with you? Since you're oh, so many things, so many things. I think I wish I'd had more self-confidence um it's that thing about so i always sort of put other people forward and bizarrely i've even just as i was saying that earlier i'm doing it recently on another project um you know i'm i'm, I'm now taking a, a scary step into the drama world and you know uh, it's as much as you think you would grow in confidence um yeah i wish i had more confidence to back myself early on um and just kind of go for it um but you know, when I was starting, which was probably um, 2005, 2006, um, you know, there just wasn't very many female directors at all. And I was always, as a producer, looking for male directors or, or directors that had done something like this before or, or whatever. So I think 
um, you know, backing myself earlier probably is what I would say to that. It might be a, a bit of a gendered thing. Would anyone else like to add anything that they wish they knew? Uh, everyone hasn't got their mics on. Santilla? I would just say, just picking up on something that Jen talked about, this idea of um, families and um, uh, caring responsibilities. I think one of the things that I wish I'd known was how hard it is as a female filmmaker. I, I think it probably would have changed my mind had I known how hard it, how mm. hard it is because it's, I feel like because of the constant um, uh, struggle to sort of work the ladder of the credits and getting your work up, you're constantly having to sacrifice so much. And, you know, it's very, it's, 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 it's hard to make a living when you're first starting off because you're not earning enough money and there's just so many sacrifices that you have to make. And I think had I known that, I would have uh, reprioritized a lot of things in my personal life, for example, whereas now I'm at a point where I'm like, well, I've already committed to what I'm doing and I do want my career to be at a certain level and I just have to live with those choices. But it definitely is very frustrating to, 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 to see just how incredibly gendered a lot of these industries are and how... Um, success comes by essentially playing with the system the way it's been designed. It's been designed for men, really, and specifically white men. So that's something that I wasn't aware of when I started. Mm. Thank you. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, probably we would like to offer anywhere where we think um, there might be key opportunities for people in the screen, screen industry, but we can maybe come, through, come to that as we go through um, you know, uh, 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 th there might be specific questions about how you cast your documentaries or do you have a business plan, um, those kinds of questions. But I'll, because we want to make access to the people on the floor, um, there's a couple of questions coming through about um, collaborations. And many of you mentioned the idea that um, someone opened a door, someone pointed you in the right direction, uh, someone offered you um, an opportunity and and I gather in quite a few cases you you gathered important collaborators collaborators with whom you repeatedly work so that would I know Jen has worked a few times with David Michaud Dillian's um, making a second film with someone um, what's the importance you know uh, of getting people to work with and 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 your experience of collaborative storytelling it's a question from the uh from the uh from rebecca fleming i um i'm happy to speak to, oh Gillian, you go first please no no you go you you go i, I mean I, I was just gonna say i mean collaborations everything and that's for me the most satisfying part of the filmmaking process and i have worked with a number of editors this, for um many years a lot of the same cinematographers um if the subject if the question is speaking to collaborative storytelling with documentary subjects. I think um, that's a slightly different question and a really interesting one. And, um, but I, before I speak to that, actually, I'd like to hear what Julian says to that. Uh, I was just gonna sort of say, I think it's really important when you're starting out in the industry to, to, to have the confidence, as you've said, Jen, to be, but in, in the sense of networking and getting yourself out there and joining like places like Screenworks for any of their um, in-person sort of opportunities as well and actually sort of making contact face-to-face. -face. I think that's really important. Um, but I also think, um, yeah, the, I agree, the same thing. It, it's about finding those people that you can trust as well to work with that get you and you get them. Um, I think that's really important because the industry can be quite difficult in that way too. Like often there are, um, you know, just from my experience across all the years, I've seen various um, partnerships start up or and then fall apart and things like that. And so I think it's really important about just, you know, picking those right people to collaborate with them. Uh, and I guess there's a kind of power differential in lots of ways. So um, I think, Jen, I've heard you say that you had a specific reason for becoming a producer, not just a document, a director. Yeah, um, I mean, I think a real game changer for me at a certain point in my career was to start my own production company. 
because I realised in order to have a sustainable career, um, you know, I didn't own any of the IP in my projects and I had a number of, you know, commercially really successful projects and got pretty much zip for them. And that was when you're trying to sustain a career is really difficult. And I was right on the edge of just saying when I had my second child and I just finished a film and I've done two films with babies in the edit and exhausting. Um, and I was like, okay, that's it. I got to apply for a job, a normal job somewhere. And I was filling out an application form for a job and I got a phone call that I, I received this fellowship that I didn't even know existed. And, and that was a real game changer for me. So I just say that to say that it's, it's, it is tough. And I think if you can be smart about it, um, you know, that is, that is a good idea. And part of being smart about it, I would also say having now brought up um, a number of younger people through my company or just through um, the years that I've been working is the ones that I end up working with are the ones that come in and don't say, oh, I want to make films, I want to make films necessarily, and can you help me make my film? Because when you're running a production company making your own films, that's quite difficult. But if someone comes and says, I've got this skill and I'm willing to do this, it's the people that come in and are just up for it that I've ended up saying, actually, you've got some great skills and, you know, and you find a way of utilising those skills and then you don't ever want to let them go. And I've got someone in our company at the moment who's gone from, you know, being an assistant to co-directing a film with me. So um, I think if you're prepared to really earn those credits, there's no way I could have started a production company without any credits. But I got to the point after probably Sherpa it was where I went, okay, now's the time, I'm going to do it. And, and made the break, if you like. And that's been a real game changer. It's also hard work running a production company and I have a great business partner, um, Joanne McGowan, but um, that has meant that I can start to kind of build a more sustainable career and not be going project to project, um, hand to mouth. A lot of people uh, that are listening today are probably trying to make decisions about what, what they do and when. So for example, uh, whether to start making a lot of sm small films or, you know, put their energy towards a feature. So uh, maybe I'll flip throw to Yara, uh, uh, Yara, sorry, um, and ask about that particular question because um, uh, along with Jen, you've made feature docs. Uh, what would be your view on that? I just say just keep making, like make something, like get out there and you know whether it's you know a two minute piece or a seven minute uh, um, a long form current affairs piece a documentary series a feature doc an art piece or just something that you're jamming with a bunch of other creative friends you know then i just say just keep making stuff because you don't really know where things lead you either uh, if you were i mean and, and i think that also comes to um, you know, choosing your collaborators and, and finding that community of other people who are going to help you make your films, you know, whether that's producers or cinematographers or editors or um, sound designers or composers, you know, just find that community of people who, um, you know, hopefully will you'll draw on um, throughout your career. Um, and just go and make stuff with people. Like if you're if you're not getting to make the things or get commissions for things that you really want to make, um, I don't think that that should stop you from getting out there and doing it. Um, and uh, it doesn't matter really what form it takes. It's just about that practice, about getting out and and practicing the form. Um, and because you just don't know where something is going to take you. There's a question there about kind of how you meet the people and how you kind of get in in the fray. Um, and I guess there would be a variety of ways um, where people can meet other people. Um, what, what would be the best suggestions for people to hook up with their, um, their, their um, tribe, to their filmmaking tribe? I had a film student once that was brilliant at this. Um, he just went to every single afters event, every single anything event. He just volunteered for a whole host of filmmakers 
And to me, he's the poster boy because he is known by absolutely everybody now <laughs> and loved. And that's hard. I'm, I'm actually uh, an introvert and I used to find that really hard. But I remember just having to consciously suck it up and go and just turn up to these events. Um, I've been quite relieved during COVID not to have to go to so many. But I, I do think, to Gillian's point, that's, that's a really important one when you're starting out. And, and further to that, it is that thing of just, you know, finding people whose work you admire, who, who live, you know, in your area and either asking to collaborate with them, like Yara's been saying, and, and work on small things together so you can become a support network or going to a bigger production company or a, even a small one and just saying, listen, if you want any research done or if you want any forms filled out, I'm happy to be that person for you. For me, it was like, do you, you know, do you want to work on this adventure race? I'm like, sure, I'm up for it. And that decision led to this access to this whole world that is now my total specialty. I mean, I never set out to be a mountaineer. It was just a, a, a cheat's way to get into filmmaking. Mm. Um, and so it was just, and, and I did a lot of stuff for a long time um, for free while I had that job at IF. So if there's a way you can have a side hustle, um, I reckon that's a great way because you've got your bases covered and it's amazing if you're really passionate about it and if you're really driven and you can kind of find a way of being a little bit flexible with your other work while you're just building up those credits and getting access to people. And, you know, we've got a researcher that came in to our company not long ago and suddenly she's like, oh God, we can't lose her. And we've got her production managing something else and I'm, you know, on a bunch of about three other projects. So um, it's making yourself available and being up for doing anything and not saying, well, I'm only a director. Sorry, I can't do any of that work. Um, is what so I in, internships and attachments might do that, but maybe we should turn our attention to ways to get development money because um, there's a bit of a spread of the way in which you've funded your project. Some of you have gone to philanthropy. Some of you have been funded in networks. Um, does anyone have anything they would like to offer into the kind of discussion about, you know, where to start thinking about um, pitching for development. I mean, maybe other than the agencies. Uh, um, I would say just as was also it's it's adding on to what Jen's just said as well. It, it answers this question. It's about also not being afraid to 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 talk to those in the industry who have the experience already as well so going to the the production companies you know researching who are the producers out there or the directors that are out there that have been working in the industry and don't be afraid to put yourself forward to them as well or ask for their their support or their mentoring things like that I think that really um certainly helps it it certainly helps in in um, in helping to finance projects or develop projects as well is that often when you're an emerging filmmaker, um, the networks as well as the, the agencies often like to see that you have someone who has some ex more experience than you that you're collaborating with. Um, so I think that, you know, yeah, definitely those sort of networking opportunities often help you make those relationships, I think. Yeah. I might um, throw the next question to Santilla uh, about, um, I noticed that everyone on the pan panel has their, their shtick or their identities and um, one of, one of your, um, your, your public profile is around public conversations and an interest in storytelling. So um, I think funding bodies are really interested in this idea of the the personal, the authentic story, that there's a reason why you should tell the story, not just that, you know, like suddenly you've got this idea. And I think that works with your pitch. So um, we did some work with Gender Matters the year before last on, um, on pitching and, and getting confident in pitching, but really working out what is, what is your story. So uh, Santilla, what, what would you say in, in relation to that in regard to the kind of finding your pitch and telling your story? Um, 
uh, yeah, I'm trying to think about how to that succinctly. Um, how do you find your voice? I don't know. I think I always start from a point of curiosity. Um, and that's the reason why I work across different formats is because I try to figure out what am I trying to, what am I curious about? What is the question and which format does it fit? Um, and what I always want to, what I always, I'm curious about is always from, is generally from my lived experience. So I, I very rarely um, seek out things that I, 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 I feel that I can't tell, but also I, like I was saying before, you know, my relationship with, because I work with the historical archive, I know, I know how, you know, through history, certain stories, certain communities, certain people have been marginalized. And I am very mindful of the responsibility that comes with that, but I'm also very mindful of not continuing that violence. And so when I work collaboratively with the people that I'm documenting, part of that is not is you know it's very easy to sort of go because I started off in broadcasts and there's a very broadcast way of going into something and talking and interviewing people and um, getting what you think the story is and what I've learned over the years to do is to first of all listen to what the community itself themselves are trying to say about it step away from it then go through my own editorial process of where I think I should be what I think I should be looking at I have the base myself and with my collaborators and my editorial team about what we think it is. And then somewhere along that way, find a very ethical uh, conclusion where I feel comfortable that should this go into the historical canon, as in a hundred years from now, someone looks at that and they're, you know, it's not problematic. Well, it, it always is to some degree, but in the sense that it is the truth as I know it to be at that point when I'm documenting it, there is a big responsibility and that requires a lot of time, a lot of work, it, it, it requires, spending time with people it requires involving people in the process and it just means that it is more ethical it's it takes longer um to sort of do that than if you if you went in in a broadcast sense where you know what you're trying to say and what you're trying to do um but it is more rewarding in many ways because you're allowing these communities that traditionally haven't had a voice to have an opportunity to share their perspective of the story but you're still you know uh authoring it in a way that fits whatever the medium is that you've chosen to tell that story. So that's how I would um, talk about finding your voice or how to how to collaborate with communities that you might not necessarily be from. Yeah, so I guess it's doing your research and being ethical and in the first place from where from where the project emerges. And then I guess after that, that's when you get would get to the pitch around what it is because you've really deeply understood it. <laughs> yeah, and ask yourself, why me? Why, why am I the person to, to tell this story, right? And usually when it is complicated, that's when you should know that I probably shouldn't proceed with this. But if, if that sort of starts to make sense, then by all means, go ahead. But generally people start to unravel at that, why me? Why am I the person that's going in to tell this story? Yeah, that's right. And I guess ethics is there's so many different things in documentary that you really have to attend to. Thank you, Santilla. There's a question in the chat uh, about, uh, I think it's for Gillian. It says, Gillian mentioned um, mini documentaries. I'd love to hear people's process on distribution. So from the six by five minute format to the social content lengths. Um, so I guess it's a question about distribution. Uh, does anyone have anything to add in in response to that question? I suppose I was mentioning the, the the shorter sort of docos in the sense of that's the program that I began work began sort of my working life in this industry was on called ICAM, which was an Indigenous cultural magazine style program. So those, pro, those stories were sort of anywhere between three to five minutes in length often. But they were, um, you know, it would already had a, had a house, I suppose, in that sense. Um, I think it's difficult these days, but also it's like not difficult because we, we live in a world now where there's so much online content. And so people, I, I don't do it myself, but, you know, there seems to be a lot of people that use um, social media platforms, they use YouTube, um, creating their own channels and things like that. So that, I think that's, uh, you know, as an, um, as an emerging sort of filmmaker, if you're not being able to get access to broadcasters, then that's a place to start. 
Um, but there's also initiatives, like keep, keep your eyes and ears open for any initiatives that come up. I know that like SBS and ABC often um, do initiatives these days, those short form projects are on their online. So it's on their SBS on demand or on iView sort of um, channels. So um, yeah, it's worth, worth just sort of keeping your eye open for those opportunities when they come up too. Where would you find those opportunities, Jill? Like, how would you get in the loop, be sent them? <laughs> um, how do I see them? I sort of come across them from um, if mag like being a you know following if magazine on Facebook and things like that, um, ABC and SBS. Um, you know, Facebook gives you all those kind of things, um, but also just. Uh, uh, being sometimes the the agencies as well in in your you know in New South the Screen Australia, Screen Australia and Screen New South Wales for example they often have lists where they will send out information about anything that they're collaborating with any of the broadcasters on so it's worthwhile being on those lists as well. Um, I I wanted to ask a question, uh, Yara. Uh, you mentioned in something I read uh, about the importance of making stories. Uh, that are about global conversations on the issues of our time. So we've talked a bit about local networks and, um, and but there's also kind of a global uh, industry and there's ways you get visible um, and that would include, um, you know, global networks, you know, for distribution and so on. So how are you all thinking about the um, the kind of the global, the international for your stories, but also for how you work in a global industry? Um, do you mean in terms of how you make those connections and collaborations or in terms of, you know, the idea of the story and, and how you create that and the sort of people you bring in, all that? Well, it could be either of those, but I think, I guess if you're a new person, you might be thinking, you know, I, I, I want to make stories about, you know, something that, that is like, you know, a, a globally important issue mm -hmm. and, you know, how you kind of manage to get that out there uh, con to connect. I think it's, I think especially with COVID, it's um, increasingly difficult to make international films if you're based in Australia just by virtue of our border situation um, and then also you know, for safety reasons so hopefully that changes but who knows when that will be um, when it comes to making films uh, that are global in nature I suppose um, if you want to do that from within Australia um, you would just I think looking at it from a lens of looking at the story in through a lens of okay this is a global issue and there are some universal themes here that are relatable to someone you know living here in Australia but also to someone who's in Iceland or in um, Saudi Arabia or uh, wherever it is around the world and I think that universality is something that is good to strive for anyway when it comes to storytelling, especially with the rise of distribution platforms and the streamers um, who have a global reach and are looking for um, stories that may appear to be hyper-local, but then also have those universal elements. Um, you know, when it comes to international filmmaking from here in Australia to other territories, I think that that's just gonna, going to be really difficult to do um, for the foreseeable future, unless you have established networks already abroad um, and can work with other collaborators on something and do that sort of semi-remotely, but that's also really not ideal. Yeah, and I guess, well, we're not really going to get out of the country and go to film festivals, which is which is upsetting, no doubt. Um, maybe we could think about that linking to the um, the nuts and bolts of filmmaking. So your film Unseen Skies um, is a is a global issue, surveillance and AI and 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 so on. Um, I had a question about casting or vetting for documentary. So 
obviously the talent's really important. So, so do, do you have a process and, and others might like to answer this as well for, for kind of casting who will be in your documentary, which if you've got someone who, who dominates um, a lot of the film is really important. Like how do you work out the, is whether it's going to work or not? Um, when it comes to a lot of my shorts and that feature documentary, um, Unseen Skies, it has traditionally in the past, I have traditionally cast someone who is working on, on a particular issue that I'm interested in and working on it in a way that I found really fascinating or different or unusual or unexpected and wanting to bring that into the film itself in order to present this idea in what I hope is an un, in an unpredictable way. Um, so really it's looking for those individuals that are sort of working on these global issues and thinking about them in ways that um, you know, perhaps most people haven't thought about them before and then using you know, film as the medium to kind of relay those ideas. Hmm. Um, the other thing I thought might be useful for entry level people um, to think about is the idea of a business plan and um, the idea, you know, how much you scope out where you fit in the market, you know, because quite often people are completely absorbed with making the film and just getting the film up. But, you know, I think probably people who are more experienced have a business plan for the the film and how they're going to create momentum for it and for their career after it, given that quite often uh, your last project and how well it does um, influences your your next project and what you can can do. So, well, can I invite anyone who might like to speak to that idea of the business plan? I can speak Jen? to you. Thanks, you. I wish I could say, yes, you need a business plan. I, it's always the last thing I think of because um, I'm a bit, um, even though I have a business degree, it's the last thing I want to do. I just want to make the film. But I did do my master's around the particular project around mountain. Um, so that's probably a good example of where I looked at a project and thought, how can I avoid the pitfalls of what really becomes um, a film, a normal release schedule is like a mountain peak, if you like, and it, it makes some money for a while and then it trails off and then that's it. Um, and so with Mountain, we really looked very carefully and we're now looking at doing the same thing with River with this next film where we are building a circuit of, um, of live performances um, so that we can have more of a mountain range of films than, than a peak, if you like. Um, but I think just to speak to the, the other part about the personal brand, um, I mean, I think with any of these women on the panel, like when they've made something, um, you've got to really, that's the moment to really then follow up with kind of marketing and like a self-marketing, which sounds like a horrible thing, but you have this tiny window after you've made a film um, and that's the moment where people are kind of talking about it they saw it at the festival though this and that and the next thing and you want to get front of mind depends what kind of filmmaker you are if you if you're really only doing your self-driven projects um, but if you actually just want to get hired as a as a documentary filmmaker um, you know so it depends on what your your style and strategy is, but um, it is important to capitalize on those successes and to put stuff online and to, you know, after a film, then, you know, send a link to a producer that you'd like to work with or someone you'd like to collaborate with and say, look, I've just made this film and I'm really interested in, you know, potentially doing some more work or, you know, can I come and have a cup of tea? And if you've got a film that's just screening at a festival or on Guardian shorts or, or something, whatever the case may be, um, to use that moment where it's fresh um, to, to capitalise. And, and that could go for something that you've just made yourself and put online. Yeah. Um, so, but it just struck me, and it's an earlier question, um, that I, I can't remember exactly what the question was, but it was around this idea of, of, of what it is to be a filmmaker and, and this idea of identity. And I think it just really struck me when I when I watched Santilla's um, clip that she played that 
actually people are hungry, producers are hungry for voices like that and Yara's voice and Gillian's voice, people that have a point of view because as a filmmaker and as a director, that's kind of all it is. It is being a human being that has access to a certain kind of story, has a particular area of interest. You look at most filmmakers, most directors in the world, they retell the same stories over and over in different ways. Um, but it is what is interesting to people and why they get return audiences that, is that they have a particular point of view of the world and that is what is interesting. And, you know, you look at the work of these panellists and there's no no accident why their careers are growing because they have this really strong point of view on the world and they have something to say about the world um, and that is something that it, it took me ages to figure that out I wish I'd learned that earlier that was the very first question that actually what is it that you have to say about the world what is your own unique point of view and I'm I'm for example particularly interested in the underdog or the underestimated or the underrepresented. Um, I like telling those stories, um, even though it just looks like I make adventure films. Um, so that's my thing. Each of these panelists has a completely different, different thing. And there is a demand for those voices. So I think if you can find a way of getting your work, any work out there, um, you know, people are hungry for that. Yeah, I guess it's what it is to be human and that's why people are connecting to documentaries, you know, around that piece. Um, you mentioned River, which I think had some Documentary Foundation Australia funding, did it? Did uh, it? Yeah, it was part of that um, environmental program. Yeah, um, and I just wondered about, like, that's a sort of specific place where people can go to get their documentaries made and have them put up. Can you kind of maybe just speak to that process yeah I mean to be honest it's it's a difficult path um but again I think if you are have a particular area of interest there are special interest groups um so I executive produced a project recently that went through the DAF uh the Shark Island things actually and they managed to get quite a lot of um funding because there are these special interest groups um and if you via DAF, and they're really good at connecting you to those people, can connect. And I think Yara, you might have had some funding through that mechanism as well. There are ways if 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 you can do that. But again, you need to have earned your chops and be able to show those people that you have the capacity to produce the work. So it comes back to the chicken or the egg thing. But you know, even within your community, you might be able to get um, raise some money to talk about something. Just also just want to speak to this idea of issues and characters and casting that we were talking about earlier that I think something that I used to try and tell the documentary students when I was teaching at afters is that that issues um, and I make films about issues but I am always super careful not to make an issue film um, that you that characters uh, what um, are the way that you know that you tell stories through characters so in the case of Sherpa I chose um, a Sherpa who I knew very very well who was about to break the world record for the most number of cents on Everest and he became the character through which we told that story um, about Sherpas on Everest and Yara is telling her story very clearly through the lens of this particular character so I do get pitched a lot of issue films um, and often, and then the first question is, is it, well, whose eyes are we seeing this story? How are you telling the, um, the story of this issue? And it always comes back to character. Mm. We're almost out of time. And as it's a gender matters session, I think we should um, have put a gender lens on it. One of the participants has shared she wanted to know how she can amplify female-driven work within her own filmmaking practice. And she says, do you feel that a gender lens imbues the films that you make regardless of the subject matter? And I think that would be a wonderful place to finish. So, so is your subjectivity as people who live their lives in female bodies, is that always in play, I guess, across the... Um, the the, the way you tell stories or get access to them or get access to subjects or um, relate to the experience of your characters? Um, 
I'm I, happy to, um, oh, sorry, Gillian, please, you go. I, would, I was just going to say, I suppose, in relation to um, family rules, that series and working on that series, I would say yes, <laughs> because it was so female um, driven in terms of the leadership of the team. So the, the producer, the production manager, myself as the series producer, and then Carla Hart as the creator of it. And she was one of the, the um, physical directors for it. And, um, and then we had sort of like um, other um, shooter directors who were also female, but then we, you know, that, that was the, the main sort of driving creative team, I suppose. And we were so aware that it was, um, you know, it was a mum and nine daughters and it was telling a very female story. Um, and so in that sense, it was right to have that team. Um, we then had men working with us as well, but they very much referred to us as the women on, on that um, project and in, in terms of direction of what they what we were looking for, what we wanted from them as the crew as well. So, and they were very respectful of all that. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Um, I, because we're out of time, I'm gonna to throw to, to Jeannie. And um, from my point of view, thank you all. That was so interesting. Jeannie, are you there? I certainly am. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, that was very absorbing conversation um, and I'd like to thank our incredibly talented and articulate panel for sharing their documentary experiences with us all this afternoon. I'm sure a lot of you out there will have gained a lot of insight and hopefully inspiration as well uh, into what it really takes to work in documentary. So a huge and heartfelt thanks to our speakers, to Yara, Santilla, Gillian and Jen. Uh, and of course, to our excellent moderator, Lisa French. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you soon.